A world away from the wealth and multiculturalism of the UK's capital, there is a small seaside town in the northeast of England. Hartlepool has a Christian heritage stretching back for a thousand years. But half a century ago, Islam arrived for the very first time when a young doctor and his wife moved to the area. Dr Khan was the medical registrar and he came to work on the ward where I was working as a staff nurse. Yeah. And he'd been working a few months at the hospital and I used to see them going out in the evening sometimes from the hospital, the, the ward office window. I could see them going up and down the drive together, Dr Khan and his wife, and going out for a walk in the evening. And it was Christmas time and at Christmas time you give each other gifts. So I thought, well, I'll go and introduce myself to, the, to his wife. And I just went and to the flat where they were living, which was just near, near the, just above the entrance to the hospital. And I knocked on the door and they welcomed me in. And I gave them the gifts and that was the beginning of a very long friendship. And my husband, Terry, he was a patient at his surgery. And uh, we used to go down there. Dr Khan asked him to see what work he does. And uh, my husband said he was a joiner. And he said, uh, oh, well, I want somebody, you know, to come to the house and do a bit of work for us. So he went round and done a bit of work for him. And then from then on, uh, every time he wanted some to do, and, you know, he used to send for Terry because he used to say he's a good joiner. And then uh, after a while, um, Mrs Can asked us to come round for a bit of dinner, you know, to come round for some dinner. Anyway, I said it was very nice of them. Anyway, we went round one night and she cooked all this dinner and it was lovely. Gugu Begum. Tayeba Gugu. Right. We were very fortunate that uh, when we were quite young, I was about eight, uh, Hazrat Khalif al Masih Salis visited Hartlepool as part of his um, visit to the UK. Dr Hamid and Mrs Khan had been honoured to welcome Hazrat Mirza Nasser Ahmed, the global imam and Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, to their home. Now, Mrs Khan wished to introduce her friend Pam. I did meet the third Khalifa as well, but uh, that was in Rabwa. Oh, uh, that was the, my daughter. We went, we went to a wedding for one of uh, Dr. Khan's family members. And my daughter, Tara, was with me. And everybody was in the, um, in the lounge. And she just ran over and sat on his knee before the wedding. I remember going with uh, um, Mrs. Khan for a mullah cart. And, uh, and on that occasion, he... Uh, I asked him if he would pray for my daughter, and he said he would he would pray for her to be intelligent, and uh, and mashallah, she turned out to be very intelligent. But it's strange that you know that she got a first from Cambridge, 
And I think that's quite sort of uh, not a common thing to happen, really. So I, I think the prayers affected her quite a bit. The Khans migrated to the UK in the 1960s from the town of Rubwa, Pakistan. It was during her childhood in Rubwa that Sajda first became interested in faith. When she was quite young, uh, she told us that she had a dream that um, Khalif al Masisani came to her and said that, Jab tum saal ki hoki, main jadu karunga, which means that when you are about 35, I will um, change you with, with the kind of magic. In 1981, only in her mid 30s, Mrs. Khan became seriously ill. Saj Dahmeed from Hartlepool, first of all, she saw in a dream that uh, there was a red uh, double decker bus who was, uh, you know, rushing on towards him, and she thought she will be crushed under. And uh, also, she had the feeling that uh, I must somehow save myself. So she pushed, put, pushed the uh, bus from with her hand, the palm of her hand. And uh, to her surprise, the bus stopped and she got saved. When she related this dream to uh, her friend, her name is Palm. You know, she interpreted it. She said, you are going to have a, an attack of a, from a very serious disease because the red bus means illness to me. And, but despite the fact that apparently you will have no chance of survival, Allah would save you. So she fell ill, as uh, was predicted in the dream, and she uh, was saved as well. And she told Palm that now it's all right. She said, no, it's not all right. You saw a double-decker, so the disease is going to visit you again, and this time maybe more seriously. So. Actually, it happened so that she suffered from cancer. And the case was so advanced that the doctors lost hope. My parents went to see Khalif al Sa Salis for a mulaqat uh, or some such occasion. And he uh, sort of gave her a, a prayer or a dua and sort of said that, um, don't worry about this anymore, it's gone. And my father particularly, took this um, as sort of a, a, a prophecy or a sign. The doctors almost thought she was dead. Although, I don't know whether she was clinically declared dead or not, but the doctors had given up hope and finished everything. At that moment, she was witnessing something of the other world. She saw in the dream that she was already dead. And she was raised to the heaven and was brought to the presence of Allah. And she beseeched Allah that she had left small children, young of age, and she is very worried for, her, for their sake. So please return me to, to earth. And Allah said, you are already dead. So she said, why, why, what then? You are the proprietor of everything. You are the master of life and death. You can send me back even if I am dead. So Allah said, but you know how, how much time has passed? You are dead for the last 5,000 years. So she said, what then? You are the master not only of space, but master of time. You can reverse the clock of time as you please. So don't, don't feed me with this, you know, <laughs> that sort of answer. <laughs> so, and then Allah said, all right, I'll send you back, but with two signs, so that when you tell this story, people believe in what you tell them. And the two signs which we shown to you would be these. Number one, although the doctors are, will give you blood transfusion, but you don't need any blood transfusion. So don't take. Secondly, you will fail, feel immense pain, most terrible pain, and the doctors would fail to cure whatever they do. So with that, abruptly the interview ended and she came to, back to life. 
and uh, suddenly the doctor saw the signs of breathing and things. Already she was on blood transfusion for some time. And a quarter of uh, that bottle was already emptied when this had happened. So when she noticed that bottle, she remembered Allah's message that she doesn't require any blood transfusion. So she removed the needle by just a jerk of the hand. So the doctor insisted that I must put the needle back in the vein. And she insisted, no, Allah has told me, but he wouldn't believe naturally. So he forcefully uh, injected the needle into her artery or vein, whatever it was, perhaps artery. And the result was that immediately she threw a reaction so strong, allergic reaction, that the whole body became swollen. And the doctor got panicky and removed the uh, needle from her body. Now, this is something very special because it is an established fact, scientific observation, that if you do not throw reaction against a blood transfusion once, the same blood in the same instance is, simply fails to cause any other reaction. The reaction of the body from the same blood which has been given her is something unknown in the scientific medical history. So the doctor was so shocked. He said, I can't understand what's happening. Then the second thing followed exactly as she was told by Allah. She, start, she uh, suffered from abnormal pain in the region of operation. And uh, the doctors, despite their best efforts, though they gave her the heaviest drugs, failed to cure her of that pain. And after s some futile efforts, they failed. They said they gave up. They told the husband that we can't do anything. All that we could, we have done. So then, this, these were the two miracles shown to her in the dream which came to pass as were predicted. But a third also happened. A third part of the miracle, you know, uh, came later. When she was visited suddenly by her father who had heard of the operation and who hurried back, hurried to England, immediately rushed to England to meet uh, his dear daughter. He thought maybe she dies in the operation, so he wanted to reach the place before the operation. But he was late. When he reached uh, the hospital, that was the state in which uh, Sajda uh, was lying, suffering with extremely acute pain. And uh, she heard that her father had arrived, and she did not want to meet him in this state of pain. So she prayed that, Allah, all right, we have shown the miracles enough, and enough is enough. <laughs> so cure me before my father calls me. <laughs> and the next minute she saw there was no pain. It was there and not there, you know, like that. Next minute or within four five minutes, before the father arrived, I mean, it had totally disappeared, completely gone. And ever since she's leading a normal life, not only that, she has given birth to a beautiful young baby. And uh, both are healthy and normal, as though the doctors had told that after suffering from cancer and having gone through this uh, very serious observation and this experience, of near death, uh, you should never think of bearing children again. It's a brother. What's his name? Abid. By 1982, Mrs. Khan had recovered. Meanwhile, in Rabwa, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmed had become the new Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Before Hazur migrated to the UK, obviously he was living in Rabwa, and my father thought that that us kids weren't getting enough exposure to the Khalifa. So his plan was to take us back to Rabwa, basically so that we would then get the exposure to Hazur. He thought that his kids are growing up in the West and they have little or no contact with Hazur. They don't really know who Hazur is. They went to see Khalifa al Masih Rabbe about this idea. And Khalifa al Masih Rabbe said that, uh, no, I'm not going to let you go back to Pakistan until you have uh, converted at least 10 families to Ahmadiyyat. And my mother came out um, of this mulaqat really shocked and, and, and thinking, how will I ever convert 10 families uh, to Ahmadiyyat? Mrs. Khan now began to preach to the people of Hartlepool, starting with her oldest friend, 
Pamela Elder. I would say probably every other day I was at their house. I think my mum thought I was moving in. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it was it was always Mrs. Khan that was out, that I was friendly with, and we we used to chat about all sorts of things, and we were friends for quite a few years before the to the topic of religion was broached. I think she was, thought she might frighten me off if she started immediately talking about religion. My father uh, in, uh, initially thought that uh, my, my mother was very enthusiastic about the belief and, and wasn't sure. Uh, he was a quiet man, so it, I think it was harder for him initially to um, be as enthusiastic as her. Mrs Khan used to have um, meetings in the house and she called you know, various uh, members of the senior members of the community to talk. And on a couple of occasions, George Civil Khan came to speak and it was after one of his uh, talks that uh, I decided to do Beth then. Dr Khan had initially been shy, but was inspired by his wife's success to invite English gentlemen to Islam. I was uh, in a public house in Stockton with a friend having a drink and he told me that his wife had met a, a lovely uh, doctor's wife um, and they were Muslims and she'd been to see them and she'd been to see them um, and she said what nice people they were. So he said to me, would you like to come and visit them? So I said, yes, I don't see why not. So I went there to Connorsley for Road and uh, and I was immediately taken by by Dr. Khan because he was such a, a, a shy, um, reticent, but very, 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 very kind man. And he stood at the door, and I can just I can still see him stand at the door and say to me, "Hello, hello, come in, come in." We had a very, very nice uh, talk, and then he gave me some little pamphlets. One was uh, Jesus on the cross. And another little, and so I'd read them, and, and then you see, it, it, it's quite a shock to the system to be told, after you've been brought up with a religion all your life, from being a baby, that, that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that he just swooned, uh, and then he was, you know, George of Arimathea took him away, and um, he's put in, 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 in the tomb. And then after three days, they got him better. And, brought it, and everybody thought he'd been resurrected. And now it seems so simple. One of Mr Khan's earliest successes came with the conversion of a policeman, the late Alex Duxfield. Mr Duxfield now began to invite his colleagues to Islam. I'd reached an age when I was about 35 when I prayed to God that he gives me a friend of, who had the same sort of utopian ideal as me, living in a nice you know, peaceful, peaceful world. And um, I remember about a month or so later, my auntie, who lives in Scotland, she got in touch with me. She's a very staunch Christian and uh, avid Bible reader. And I thought this was my prayer answer. And I used to read the Bible many times, but whatever question I asked my auntie, she couldn't give me a satisfactory answer. One other police officer in the building, his name was Alex Tuxfield, he obviously conversed with Dr. Khan quite a lot uh, about religion and it was about 1985, 86, that Dr. Khan must have asked him to ask me if I would go to his house. Because Alex Tuxfield must have told him I was a, con I was a confirmed Christian. So through this third party, he asked me to go, and I said categorically to Alex Tuxfield, no, I don't want to go. Because my idea of um, Muslims was what I was taught at school many years before, you know, when the Crusades, these English kings, or these um, European kings went to the Holy Land to fight these Saracens. And they were always classed as the good guys and the Saracens, the not so good people. So that was my initial idea of Muslims, so I didn't want anything to do with it. 
And at that time, I believe also the Ayatollah Khomeini had returned to Iran and there was problems in the Muslim world as, as then. So English people didn't have a very good knowledge of um, Islam. So I said, no, I wouldn't go. True worship of God leads a righteous man to do good to mankind. It is impossible to love God and ignore his creation. In this connection, Islam makes no distinction between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. But later on, I was doing some work in the uh, hospital, the local hospital, and Dr. Khan happened to meet me there. And he personally invited me to his house. And of course, oh, although I knew him very well, and he, I also found him a very nice man. I just, you know, still being a sort of a shy person, I thought he's, he's a, comes from a completely different background than me. We're different religions, different professions. And I just didn't want to go for some reason. And he, he set a date, so I had no choice. I had to accept. And it was probably about 10 or 12 days we could fix a date. And for those 10 or 12 days, every night I was quite nervous thinking about having to go to this house to talk to uh, a Muslim. And on the day in question, it was an evening appointment. I drove around the estate quite a few times because I didn't want to go in the house. I knew nothing about Islam. I thought I'll go and convert Dr. Khan to Christianity. <laughs> With the Khan's busy preaching to Morris Threlkeld, Bill Atkinson and other English friends, the Khalifa began to take a special interest in Hartlepool. My mother used to speak to Hazur quite regularly on the telephone and so on to get advice and he would always, give her, he would always have time for her. And then also he made a lot of effort to make trips to Hartlepool on several occasions to meet with the people that were already converted but also the people that were under the bleak. My first meeting with him. This was before I became an Amdi. I'd been invited to Dr. Khan's house for a meal. And he, I don't think he told me who he was expecting guests. But anyway, I knew, I knew he was uh, building a new uh, dining room onto his um, house. And I thought, that's strange having guests when he's having building work done, because the plaster was still wet in the, in the dining room. Anyway, I arrived that night, and it was full of people. And then he invited me to come have a meal in the dining room and there was a gentleman with a turban on and I sat next to him and he engaged me in so many uh, you know, questions and uh, things like that. And I thought, what a wonderful chap this is. I had no idea he was Khalifa because I wasn't dressed appropriately anyway. But I thought he was very interesting, very friendly, he was so jovial and uh, it made you so relaxed. And though I never realised what an important man he was and what a religious man he was, it was just like speaking to you. And I just sat there talking to him about different things, one thing to another. And, and then, we, then we had a meal and he so was there and I sat here and, and he was telling us about his exploits when he left, when he left um, Pakistan, when he had to uh, escape to, to, to go to the London Mosque. After that, and it happened very, very quickly, within, within a state of a month. I said I wanted to sign the bait. I'd only be, only been signed for about five minutes. And the phone rang. And, and I mean, it said, oh, he said, at Suzua, I've just told him I've got a new convert and he wants to speak to you. Now, this shows you that I didn't know all that much about it, but I knew in my own heart that it was the right thing for me to do. But Hazur said to me, Assalamu alaikum. Now I said, Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> because, because I didn't know, I should have said, Well, alaikum assalam, which was a thing to do. But you see, you've got to learn all these things, haven't you? Anyway, I spoke to him and he said, Oh, he said, I thought I saw a little spark there, he said. And then he wrote me a very, very nice letter welcoming to Dijamat, which I've got framed, which I've bought my bed at home. And that was in 1987. So, you know, I, uh, so it's, and I've got a picture of the, the lace as well, as well, above it and the thing below it. So, so it's, it's always there in my mind, see it every day. One book which 
I was really uh, attracted to was Jesus in India. That was more or less the deciding factor when I found out that God hadn't killed his own son or asked him to give his life for others and he actually survived the cross. That was the turning point for me. And one night I, it was a Saturday, Saturday evening, I told my wife that uh, I was going to accept Amadeet the next day. She wasn't um, very happy, but she said, yes, if you have to, you have to. The day that my husband converted, uh, <clears throat> the missionary said, he, he popped his head, he knocked on the, the door and he, he said, uh, congratulations and it's your turn next. And I said, that's what you think. And I was sort of determined that I wasn't going to convert. Well, my wife, Christine, she was very well um, into these church meetings and different things, and she became part of the church uh, committee and, of course, uh, teaching at Sunday school. And it was, she found it a very nice, uh, there were very nice people there as well. And when I initially told her about uh, Islam, she wasn't, she wasn't angry, but she, perhaps she was perplexed. Why didn't I go to church? And then uh, Dr. Khan's wife, Sajida, said, why don't you ask her to come to our house when you come? I'll have a talk with her. And I felt a bit, you know, I can't express. But anyway, I thought, I'll take her. I thought she might be a little hostile. So we went there and um, she was uh, not hostile, but it was a heated argument. She was quite surprised and perhaps not so pleased by the, this change in him. But because she was a very, uh, and is, or has always been a very loyal wife, she would accompany him when he would come and see my father uh, on a weekly basis. And this continued for a long time, uh, where she would come and she would sit with my mother. Um, initially, I actually remember that she looked quite serious and perhaps even quite somewhat unhappy. Christine Atkinson remained perplexed with Islam but Mrs Khan's friend Beryl Taylor was proving more receptive. And she used to read the Quran to us and that, you know, in English. And um, she kept asking me all the time, all the years, would you like to change? And uh, I was a little bit unsure, you know. And she used to say to me, um, you know, one of these days it will you know, somebody will come to you. And if it does, would you tell me? And I said, yes. Anyway, I went to bed one night and I had this dream about a white lady, you know, and asking me, you know, uh, to go at the, to be a Muslim and everything. And uh, was kept going, like, you know, kept like putting the arm up to come to him, or, you know, to come to her all the time. Anyway, um, after that, I kept having the same dream all the time, you know. And I thought, well, it's funny, you know, to have the same dream all the time for a week, you know. Anyway, when I went round Dr. Can uh, Mrs. Cans, I told her about it. And she said, I told you would get a sign, you know, uh, to be a Muslim. The number of people, conver uh, the converts to uh, Ahmadiyyat, increased and the number of visitors or people interested in Amadeeb increased and the house in which Dr. Khan lived was a rather large house but it became so full of people we had no room so to speak for Friday prayers and then he had a double garage and then he turned around and said I've got your uh, I've got a really um, big job for you Uncle, Uncle Terry really used to say I've got a big job for you Terry and Terry said, well, that's all right. He said, would you mind if you turn the mosque, uh, the garage into a mosque? Well, he was over the moon. The second mention in his derivation about the British is that he saw himself <coughs> in England uh, 
technology. You know, catching white birds and uh, he interpreted this dream as uh, the British people accepting Islam. I have chosen Hartlepool to mention this particularly because here I see the seed of the fruition of this prof in these prophecies. Here I see the development of a community which is characteristically British, overwhelmingly British, not made of components from Pakistan mainly, but mainly the British people themselves, were also, in the grace of Allah, very devout and uh, very sincere in their attempt to learn Islam. Beryl's husband Terry transformed the garage into a mosque, and now the Khans began to preach to a new family. Well, it started off with my brother Paul, and he kept it very, very quiet to himself. And then I used to pay visits to my parents, and periodically, my brother Paul used to disappear and we were, and I kept saying to me, Mum, where's our Paul gone? She used to say, oh, he's just gone in another room. And I said, well, he's been gone an awfully long time. And then all of a sudden she told me that he'd, he'd gone in to say his prayers. And I was like, what? She said, oh, yes. And slowly, slowly, he, he started to change as a person, and he got really nice. And then all of a sudden, I was like totally taken back, because I, I just couldn't believe like the change in him. And then he started to, he was talking to my mother a lot, and he kept saying, you'll have to come to prayers on Friday. No, you want you keep going, you keep doing what you're doing, and maybe. And then one day I'd said I would go through to see her. And she said, Oh no, I, I, I'm going to meet uh, our Paul's friends, Sajida and Dr. Khan. She said to me, Would you like to come? Would you like to come and meet Dr. Khan and Sajida and his family? And I said, Okay, yes, I'll come. So I could, so that was three of us started to come on a Friday. And then I think my father, Bill, started to get like a bit left out. Well, you know, and he kept saying, well, where you're all going? So he asked me, he said, are you going on a Friday, our Vivian? So I said, yes. I said, would you like to come? He said, yeah, I think I will come. So that's how we all started to come. And then Auntie Lily, uh, my mum's cousin, used to visit us and stay maybe for a month or two weeks, whatever. And she got curious and she started to ask my mother and my father and Paul and they said, would you like to come along? And she did. And that was, then they got all of us. <laughs> In total, six members of the Hedges family accepted Islam. Paul, his mother Marion, father William, sister Vivian, aunt Lillian and wife Rose. The new converts began to receive attention from the national media and Mrs Khan's photo was featured in the Telegraph. Soon, these converts were spreading the message of Islam around the world. Pamela Elder, a nurse, travelled to Rabwa to help develop the town's medical facilities. Meanwhile, Dr Khan took a delegation of converts to the Jilsa Salana in Guardian. Bilal Atkinson performed Wakfe Arzi in Russia, where he helped sow the seeds of Ahmadiyat. The Islamic lifestyle was quite a change for some of the new converts. I said to Hamid when I went, um, you know, he said, I'm not going to tell you to stop drinking. He said, you know, Islam is, 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 is um, 
you can make your own decision what you want to do. You're not, you're not forced to do anything. And, and I said, but he said, well, when, you will stop eventually. And I didn't believe him. Then I did have a little lapse, unfortunately. I lost my job and I got very depressed. And, uh, and I said to her maid, you know, I said, if I hadn't become an amdi, I would have committed suicide. And that's a terrible thing to do. I mean, that's, that's the worst sin you can possibly do. Um, and Bilal came to the house one day uh, and wondered, you know, where, why we had to see me. And I was absolutely, well, I was, I was, I was inebriated. So I could hardly stand up. And he was very upset and he said, well, you know, get yourself right. And, and I said, don't go tell anyone, will you? And so, <laughs> and obviously he told Hamid. And Hamid rang the Khalifa and told him and said that Morris is in a bad way. Or oh, they used to call me Mahmoud, which I quite liked, Mahmoud, because he was nearest to nearest to get to Morris. Um, and, and he I saw, what a kind man. He sent me some homeopathic medicine. And it was just a tiny little bottle like that, with a little dropper on. And he said, get a glass of cold water and put two drops in the water. And he said, drink it, take it every day, and it'll take all the urge to drink away. And it did, it worked. Just a simple thing like that. Only a brief word about alcohol. There is no doubt that it is causing immense harm to the social, moral, and physical fabric of the society. They, its effects are responsible for most of the crime in this country. Medical authorities in this country have consistently and strongly advised the government to take steps to reduce its consumption. And with that, of course, when he found out I was a Muslim, he was very annoyed about it. Oh, Muslim, I mean, you know, you, know, you should be in with all, all this. Anyway, I told him this. And so when he came, uh, and of course, when my dad met me, he was so quiet, so timorous, you know. Oh, and, uh, and me said to him, well, he said, uh, Mr. Threlkeld, he said, uh, how do you prefer Maurice Threlkeld, as you know him, or as Mahmoud Karim, as we know him, as a, you know, as a sober man and getting on in his life, or do you remember him when he, when he was, Oh, he said, yes, he says, I do. <laughs> I prefer him as he is now. And he never, ever forgot that, my father, because when he was very, very ill, when he was, because he died with the cancer, and uh, I used to go out, well, but I stayed with him. And he said to me, go for prayers. So from being anti-Muslim and Islam, he became pro, just like that. And that he only ever talked to Gandhi once. In 1994, Mrs. Khan's cancer returned. Nevertheless, she continued to care for the Amdis of Hartlepool. One particular evening, I, I was going through a bad time myself, and I was at my mother's, and my father wasn't alive then. And uh, Sajida really was not in a well state herself. And it must have been about something to seven and a knock came to Marion's door my mother and she said go and see who's at the door Vivian and when I opened the door it was Sajida and I said come in she said oh, I can't come in I've, I've got to I've got I'm in a rush and she had two bags of shopping and she just like put them down at the front door. And and I said, what do you want me to do? She said, oh, they're for you. And I leant over to thank her, and she just said, the, the basics, what you're going to need. And she said, I'm going to have to go. But she said, I had to do this. She said, because there was no way I was going to sit down and eat my meal, knowing that you had nothing. And it was the most touching thing that anyone has ever, ever done for me. If somebody had brought me a case full of diamonds, it, it meant more because it was all the things I needed. It, there was flour, sugar, potatoes, onions, veg, you name it. They were all like things, your yeah, everyday things, but were very important. And I'll never, ever forget her for that. And she was, it must have been a strain for her to do it, because she, she really wasn't very well. 
Mrs. Hahn had now been preaching to Christine Atkinson for several years without success. With her cancer spreading, time was running out. And even when she was really, really ill and she knew that she was dying, she, she never ever said, are you going to convert? She always took an interest in what you said. She always respected what you said. And um, although she, she didn't agree with some of the things you said, she still accepted that was your opinion. She um, was so enthusiastic that even when she was very ill at the end of her life, uh, she had cancer and um, it had affected her memory. Uh, but even though she didn't have all the words to speak, even when she would see the nurses that would come and, and to look after her, she would start preaching to them and talking about God and how uh, the existence of God. Her uncle, Mam uh, Mamu Manan, visited us, and um, he observed that she uh, would often have a lot of pain, but whenever any of her uh, the, the the English ladies that had converted or or the people that she was preaching to came to visit, she would sit up and appear as if she was well and would talk to them quite happily until they left. And then um, it was obvious again, and it was apparent that she was quite unwell and um, in pain. And he asked her that, how, how, how do you manage to do this? And she said it was because uh, she didn't want any of the ladies that she had told uh, and, and taught so much about God uh, to think for even a second that um, she was in pain and that perhaps uh, God had not helped her. I used to have a dream that there was a white shiny shape at the end of my bed <clears throat> and I used to wake up screaming when the shape was here, it frightened me. And I used to wake everybody in the house woke up and used to be frightened because I'd had this dream. And over the years she moved around my bed and I got really frightened because I thought I was going to die. Um, and she got closer and closer and this happened over a period of a long time. And, um, and then I had one dream where um, she was there, but she bent over me and I saw her face for the first time. And it wasn't a lady, it was a man. I didn't know, I'd know, I didn't know who this man was. And it wasn't until a long time after that I'd been going to Dr. Carnes that I actually saw a photograph of him. And... Um, so uh, Dr. Kern and uh, Sida arranged for me to go and meet him. And when I went into his office, he was dressed all in white, just like in my dream. And his face was glowing like it was in my dream. And I'd never seen anybody with such a serene and beautiful face. Wa alaikum salam, Christine. How are you? I had a, a, a dream that my father was ill and in hospital and my mother and my brother and myself were crying and I told them that we, I'd have to go and leave them and my mother said no and I said no I have to go, I have to leave and I woke up crying and I was so upset um, and then afterwards we had an appointment with, to go and see Hazur and we went in his office and he said salam to everybody and then he said you know Christine there comes a point when you have to leave your family and my heart was just pounding because in my mind I thought he knows about my dream and how does he know about my dream? So Sajida was saying, tell him about your dream. So I told him and he said, you're going to leave your family spiritually, not physically. And now's the time you have to think what you're going to do, uh, which path are you going to take? And so when we came out from his office, um, I told Dr. Khan that I would read a Holy Quran because I'd never read a Holy Quran from beginning to end. I'd heard verses from it and I'd heard uh, some of the, my husband explained some of the commentary. But I'd never actually held one. And then Daddy Uma, uh, Dr. Khan's mother, gave me a, a, a copy of a Holy Quran. And when I took it off her, my hand was shaking and a voice inside said, there's no turning back. And I read it, but before I'd finished reading it, I knew then I was going to convert. It was a total shock. It was out, complete out of the blue, but instead of euphoria, I was so happy. At last, five years of preaching, not only 
Sajid did most of the preaching, but I used to do it as well. And I think she just um, lost the argument, so to speak, and just accepted that what you we were saying was true. And she was very influenced by the fourth Khalifa. She loved him very much. In December 1994, Sajda Khan passed away. Khalifa al-Masih Rabi was very pleased with the, the fact that, uh, mashallah, both my parents were trying so hard in the bleak. And um, he even uh, said to her that, um, inshallah, your name will be remembered in the history of um, UK ladies as Queen Victoria. Um, as a, as a sort of compliment that, mashallah, she was so good at her, her in her tabligh efforts. جو عزیزہ ساجدہ حمید کی نماز جنازہ غائب ہے عام طور پر تو میں حاضر جنازوں کے ساتھ غائب جنازے پڑھ دیا کرتا ہوں لیکن اس ملک میں انہوں نے ایک ایسا عظیم کارنامہ کیا ہے اس کی وجہ سے میں چاہتا ہوں کہ نمایاں طور پر ان کی نماز جنازہ ادا کی جائے اور اس میں ساری دنیا بھی دعا میں شامل ہو جائے گی یعنی جنازے جنازہ نماز جنازہ تو ہمارے ساتھ نہیں پڑھ سکتی اور دعا میں شامل ہو جائے گی ان دونوں میاں بیوی ڈاکٹر حمید اور ساجدہ نے مجھے لکھا کہ ہم چاہتے ہیں واپس چلے جائیں کیونکہ یہاں ہمارا پوری طرح دل بھی نہیں لگ رہا اور کام بھی ٹھیک سیٹ نہیں ہو رہا ہے تو ہمیں اجازت دیں کہ ہم واپس چلے جائیں ان کو میں لکھا کہ خاص طور پر ساجدہ کو مخاطب کر کے کہا کہ تم کیا پیچھے چھوڑ کے جاؤ گی کوئی تم نے جماعت نہیں بنائی خالی ہاتھ یہاں سے جانے کو تم بھجوانے کو میرے دل نہیں چاہتا اس لیے چلے جانا مگر تھوڑی دیر کے لیے ٹال دو اس فیصلے کو اور کوشش کرو خدا تمہیں توفیق دے یہاں جماعت قائم ہو جائے اس کے نتیجے میں دونوں بہت ہی صحیح فطرت تھے حمید تو ہیں بھی انہوں نے فوری فیصلہ کیا کہ ہم جب تک یہاں جماعت قائم نہیں کریں گے ہم نہیں جائیں گے اور پھر جماعت قائم کی جب تو قائم کرنے کی توفیق ملی پھر جایا کہاں جاتا تھا اپنے روحانی بچے ان کی روحانی ماں بنی ہوئی ایسی تربیت ان کی کی اور اتنا پیار تھا آپس میں یہ ان کے وصال کے بعد ہمارے جو دیکھنے والے ملنے والے وہاں گئے تھے جنازے کے بعد شامل ہونے کے لیے وہ بتاتے ہیں کہ والحانہ محبت کا اظہار تھا ان انگریزوں کی طرف سے جن کو جنہوں نے ساجدہ کے فیض سے اسلام قبول کیا اور بہت اچھی تربیت اور انگلستان میں ایک ہی جماعت تھی ابھی تک شاید یہ ایک ہی ہو جس میں انگریزوں کا غلبہ تھا اور غیر ملکی نسبتاً کم تھے کیونکہ انہوں نے بعد میں مجھے لکھ دیا ہمیں لکھ دیا کہ اب ہمارا جانے کو دل بھی چاہتا اس لیے جب جنازے کا سوال ہوا ناش کا کہاں دفنائی جائے تو میں نے ڈاکٹر حمید سے کہا کہ وہیں دفنائیں اسی سے زمین کا اب حق ہے کہ ان کو اپنے پاس رکھے تو ان شاء اللہ اثر کی نماز کے مان بعد عزیزہ ساجدہ کا کی نماز جنازہ ہوگی مسز خانز ینگس سن عابد واز اونلی 11 ایئرز اولڈ مائی مدر پاسٹ اوے آئی تھنک واز دا تھرڈ آف ڈسمبر ان 1994 اباؤٹ ا ویک لیٹر آئی گوٹ ا میسج فرام Hazrat Khalif al-Masih Rabe uh, through one of his family members that Ramzan is coming and so you should come and spend a week with me or, or spend some time with me and uh, I was really amazed Hazrat had never said this anything like this before I was just a young boy who am I to go and spend time with the uh, Hazrat Khalif al-Masih Rabe but Hazrat um, arranged for uh, me to stay in the same room with his so his grandchildren Mirza Osman Saab and his other brother, Mirza Adnan. And it was a really, really precious period for me. I got to see Hazur so much more than I could ever expected or ever deserved. But I still thought I would just be doing Seri on my own. But then I was taken to the same place where, the same dining room where Hazrat Khalifa Masih Rabbe used to do Seri. And every day he used to check my nashta, my breakfast, to see uh, what I was having. And he used to encourage me to eat more. He always used to say to me, make sure you have some yogurt because that will help you on the fast. One thing Hazur told me, he said that make sure in the afternoon you come with me on a walk. 
and I used to go, Hazur used to, I think it was after Asr prayer, used to go for a walk for about an hour, even during the Ramzan. And me and his other, his grandson Musman used to walk alongside him. Everyone else was further back. And he would used to talk, he would talk to us some other time, tell uh, us some stories. And then other times Hazur would be sil silent and quiet and just reflecting. One day, I was um, with the playing a board game, I was 11 or 12, and Hazrat Khalifa Masih Rabe came upstairs and he saw me and he didn't say anything uh, in a harsh way, but he just said to me, uh, he said that in Ramzan, is it a good idea to be playing games, board games? And then he, with that, he just walked off without saying anything with a smile. And um, anyway, I knew straight away even, uh, that it's obviously it's not correct and uh, these type of things we should abstain from especially in Ramzan and so I wrote him a letter even though I was staying in the same house saying that I'm sorry I did this and this was my mistake and then I remember that he uh, he must have read the letter because he came upstairs a few hours later uh, after all his, his day's activities were com uh, come and Hazul said I've read your letter and then Hazul hugged me and that was a really beautiful moment. And the thing is, is that again, that was the way he did tarbiyat. But also, just that whole love and affection, I'm sure, and uh, was a direct result that he knew that my mother had passed away, and he wanted to uh, help me and uh, give me uh, contentment, which is what he did. And the same the year after as well. I mean, I thought it was a one-off, but the, the year after again, I got the same message that you should come to London and spend uh, Ramzan with me or some of Ramzan with me. Dr. Khan's preaching mission continued. The next family to join would be the Wrigleys, led by the late Edward Wrigley. He was a very, very nice man, very simple man. And uh, after he converted to Islam, we used to go regularly to his house and always by the side of his chair was a copy of the Holy Quran. He was a fisherman. And one uh, morning when uh, Khalifa Tul Rabbi was visiting, uh, Fajr prayer, Mr. Wrigley came and um, Hazur said, oh, how are you? He said, oh, it doesn't matter about me. He said, what I'm concerned is, how are you? So, of course, Hazur was laughing at that. He liked Eddie Wrigley very much. By 1997, the Khalifa was staying at Hartlepool several times annually. That year, Hazur would bring the Urdu class. Looks like Nabu, huh? That was very uh, a unique and a beautiful occasion because it was the whole Urdu class came. Um, I remember there were certain uh, um, memorable characters, uh, Shokat Saiba, who had a beautiful voice, recited in Nazim. Um, there was uh, a character at that time uh, well known as Murtabacha um, that always used to accompany uh, Hazur. And the rest of the class came. And one thing that Hazur uh, would always love in Hartlepool was our memorable fish and chips. Um, so there's a beautiful walk along the beach. So Hazur used to enjoy that. And um, uh, at the end of that visit, they would also have fish and chips. And sometimes they actually had that on, the, a, couple, on a couple of occasions on the promenade. And um, so that's something he wanted to treat the Urdu class to. And I think after that, they also went on to uh, the Lake District. And my younger brother, Abed Khan Saab, he, he accompanied them to the Lake District as well. That year, Hazur brought some very special relatives. Sahibzada Mirza Muzaffar Ahmed, Sahibzada Mirza Mansur Ahmed, and a young nephew, Sahibzada Mirza Masroor Ahmed. There were so many guests with Hazrat Khalifa Sirabe. Uh, that in our three-story house, uh, Hazrat Khalim Sirabe stayed with, with his family on the top floor. Uh, there were some other guests that uh, stayed on the, the second floor. And uh, Hazur and his father um, were given mattresses in our sitting room uh, on the ground floor. And now when I think back to it, I feel almost ashamed that uh, w these were the arrangements for our future Khalifa. But at the same time, I, I, I saw at the time that Hazur had no issue whatsoever. He, was, he slept on the floor. After that, after seeing his humility, I uh, started even writing to Hazrat Khalifa Masih V before he became Khal Khalifa. And it was just because of that example that I'd seen in him. And so from every few months, I would write to him. And uh, sometimes uh, he would reply 
even back then with very beautiful letters and if he ever missed a reply he would say I'm sorry I didn't reply to your last letter but he uh, considered this a reply for the last few. By the late 1990s the Khans had converted more than 30 English adults in Hartlepool and the local community was fast outgrowing the family's garage. I know uh, my father was for many many years had a desire to open a mosque in Hartlepool and you have to think of the period at that time the Jamaat in the UK weren't building many mosques and um, so the thing is is that it seemed like quite a impossible dream to be honest. My father went to Hartlepool Council um, because uh, it was proposed uh, and he w- it was very much his desire and I'm sure he prayed very very hard that there would be a mosque in Hartlepool so that the Jamaat would have a centre and a place to worship and a place to gather. By that time, more and more people came and he said to me that we should look for a site for a mosque. So he made the inquiries with the local council and um, after a while, I think they identified 19 sites we could view. And during this time, he uh, contracted um, cancer of the esophagus. He had to undergo certain treatments. Um, But I remember going around a number of sites which the council had um, identified and we thought they all, all weren't suitable. And the last one, I think, was Room Terrace. And I said to him, I said, this might not be a very good site because as a scenes of crime officer, I was called to that site many times and being broken into. It was a children's clinic on the site. I said, it might not be a suitable site, but he says, no, we'll, we'll go for that site. So he made further inquiries. And by this time, his uh, condition had uh, deteriorated. He was becoming weaker, but he uh, got in touch with the council. And uh, I think the year was 2000, where he informed the council we were interested in purchasing the site in Broom Terrace, and they quoted a price of £60,000. And by February, the end of February 2000, Dr. Khan uh, passed away in Lyle or Lodge. And I remember that probably the last conversation I had with my father, Dr. Hamid Khan, was probably a week, 10 days before he passed away. After that, obviously, I did talk to him a little bit, but this was the last proper conversation I had with him. And uh, he said to me that uh, I I know I'm going to die soon because my uh, health is like this. But he said that throughout your life, I've only got one piece of advice for you and that is to stay close to Khalifa Wakht. He said, if you do that, then I've got no reason to worry for you. Uh, But if you don't, then I do. So I'll never forget those words. And I know obviously he prayed for you, and my mother, she will have prayed for this in her life as well. And the sacrifices that they made was the reason that Allah, I'm sure, has given me this privilege, because I know there's thousands and thousands of people within our Jamaat, not speaking externally, but within our Jamaat, who are much more talented and capable. But Allah has given me this opportunity for the last few years to serve Hazrat Khalif the Masih V uh, in a, as his uh, press secretary, but also to learn from him, to see how he works, and to uh, be able to spend a lot of time with him and to travel with him. And so the thing is, that is uh, only because of the blessings, I'm sure, of uh, what my elders did. <laughs> Uske akhlaq nirale thi adai thi ajeeb Hartli pool me kalle What is your time? Hmm? Say, say to them. No, one, what, what, what did you tell them when you invited them? How long... Uh, they were expecting to remain with us. Didn't give any time. Huh? You always play safe, huh? <laughs> <laughs> In 
April 2003, the Amdiya Muslim community was left mourning following the passing of Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmed. Before his demise, the Khalifa had appointed Maurice Mahmoud to the Global Electoral College, which would name his successor. I went and joined the election, you see. I was very concerned about it because, you know, it's a very, very, there's only a hundred, and it's a very important meeting to go to. God's going to appoint the Khalifa. And someone got up and said, well, will the people stand up uh, so we can see them, you see? Well, I didn't even turn around because I thought, well, even if I see them, I don't know who they are. And then the way went through, and then when the prison, uh, Khalifa's name was called out, every hand shot up like that. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And everybody went up and, and uh, embraced as they were. A very, very emotional time. Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the new Khalifa of the Amdiya Muslim community, now reinvigorated the Hartlepool Mosque project. In 2004, he visited Hartlepool and laid the mosque foundations. A year later, he returned for the inauguration. आज डॉक्टर हमीद खान साहब और साइदा हमीद साहिबा की रूह भी इस मस्जिद की तामीर का सवाब हासिल कर रही होगी उनको भी यह सवाब मिल रहा होगा जिनकी कोशिशों से ही रकबा खरीदा गया और उनकी शदीद ख्वाहिश पर यह मस्जिद बन भी गई अल्लाह के फजल से इन दोनों फिदाइन के लिए भी दुआ करें अल्लाह ताला उनके درجات बुलंद फरमाए और this mosque will become a symbol of mutual love and friendship and serve as a milestone amongst people of all faiths and that from here a message will spread of the love of God who has unlimited love for his creation. May Allah cause the feelings of love and affection to increase in us. I remember once Hazrat Khalifa Tamasi V a few years ago said to me that the UK's attention to building new mosques started with the Hartlepool Mosque and after that they started building more. And we see that in the last 10 years there's been many, many mosques that have been built here in the UK and there's more in the future in the pipeline. The other thing I always remember is, is that when Hazrat Khalifa Tamasi V came to open the mosque, after the reception, Hazrat returned to our family home, which was the residence. And... Um, I, when we went, uh, I, I, when I w- went into the room where Hazu was seated in the lounge, at the time there was nobody else there, and I went to Hazu and I, just out of my excitement and happiness, I, I said that Hazu, it seemed to me impossible that we would have this mosque, a mosque in Hartlepool, and I'll never forget Hazu's words. He said to me that that is what Allah Taala does. He turns the impossible into the possible. The Khalifa told him he couldn't go. They had to, he had, until he'd made a community in Hartlepool. And so I think this is why we have a, a community in Hartlepool, because the Khalifa wanted it. We thank you, Allah. We thank you, Allah. For giving us the love. We thank you, Allah. We thank you, Allah. We thank you, Allah. For giving us the love. We thank you, Allah. Thank you. We thank you, Allah. Thank you. We thank you, Allah, for giving us the love. We praise you, Allah. We praise you, Allah. We praise you, Allah, for giving us the love. We thank you, Allah. We thank you, Allah. We thank you, Allah, for giving us the love.